my name is Remy Salters. I'm uh, the CFO for Swedbank Lithuania. Yes, uh, as was introduced, uh, I, I will say a few words about why bankers are counting not only money, but CO2. So like a Ville of the three letters in sustainability, E, S and G, I will focus on the E, environment, uh, which includes uh, most importantly uh, emissions, climate change mitigation, and the sustainable use of resources. Now, um, just to be clear, um, I have a background in finance. I don't have a background in environmental science. Um, I like to walk in forests and pick mushrooms in Lithuania like uh, any other uh, Lithuanian inhabitant. I can tell about Avikas from Rodinikis, uh, but I don't know that much about CO2 and methane. Uh, nevertheless, uh, today I will talk about uh, how uh, CFOs are starting to get interested, not just in euros, but in tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Carbon accounting, as it's called, uh, is the process by which uh, organizations um, analyze and measure their emissions in order to understand their impact on the climate and then following on from that to limit it. And uh, I will talk about how Swedbank is learning how to do this. Uh, and also how we, the bank and its clients, need to work together in order to achieve uh, not just financial objectives, but also environmental objectives. But first, I'd like to set the scene a little bit in order uh, uh, to understand where this carbon accounting actually fits in. Um, for the next 10 years, the World Economic Forum has highlighted uh, 10 top risks half of those are related to uh, uh, climate and to stress on ecosystems. As we all know, the financial and human costs of climate change are increasing every year. Uh, they're perhaps more dramatic on other continents, but actually I would highlight that in, 20 th in 2021, uh, some of the biggest financial impacts were related to flooding in our own continent, in Europe. And having lived in Lithuania myself for, for some time, I can observe changes in the local climate here too. The public's and consumers' expectations from governments and from companies are increasing with time very significantly. I will not mention Greta Thunberg, she needs no introduction. What I would mention is that 2021 was an important year in the sphere of climate litigation. The oil company Shell was ordered by a Dutch court to reduce its carbon emissions by 45% before 2030. Um, governments in the past had been sued. This was the first time ever in the world that a company was ordered by a court to reduce its emissions in order to mitigate climate change. The, um, organization that took Shell to court is, has now said it will do the same for 29 other companies unless they increase their ambition to reduce ambi uh, emissions. Uh, those companies include three banks, uh, ABN AMRO, ING and Rabobank. So in that context, policymakers globally are um, converging towards a name, which is to get to net zero emissions by 2050. Net zero emissions, what does that mean? It means the large majority of emissions would be disappearing by 2050, and what cannot be eliminated would be offset through uh, capture uh, of carbon, for example, uh, in forests. Now, the, 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 as far as I'm concerned, the problem with the 2050 target is that it's in 2050. Um, I don't know if you've read the American writer Mark Twain, uh, but he famously said, giving up smoking is easy. I've done it a thousand times. Um, what's much more meaningful is to look at what's going to happen in the next decade, setting targets to 2030. So here what we have is a situation where uh, as uh, Avila, I think, mentioned, the EU has uh, targeted uh, to uh, reduce emissions to 55% of the 1990 level 
by 2030. Lithuania's own plan is to reach 70% uh, lower than the 1990 level by 2030. For context, for benchmarking, the latest uh, observations for the EU are that we, st we stood at about 34% lower than 1990 levels. In Lithuania, the number is 57% already, one could say, already, but that doesn't mean that the target in 2030 is easily achievable, especially not for all sectors of the economy. The two that really stand out are transport and industry, which have been on an increasing trend in recent years. Both of those sectors will need to cut their emissions by more than one third uh, for the rest of this decade, which equates to three to four percent annually, which is no small task in order to achieve that target. Now, the government has uh, announced the setting up of decarbonisation working groups in order to jointly agree measures to help achieve those targets. So, where do banks stand? I can tell you that banks uh, don't emit much directly. We bankers, we basically sit in offices uh, which have quite modest energy needs. Occasionally, we get on a plane for a business meeting, and that's about it. Um, Swedbank Lithuania had a carbon footprint in 2021 of 2,300 CO2 equivalent, tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, that's 40% uh, uh, lower than the level in 2019, and we're constantly bringing it down. In addition, we are already at net zero for our emissions, meaning that all of the 2,300 tons are offset. However, banks are unique. They're unique because they finance others. The global financial sector's indirect emissions, meaning emissions through, for example, financing activity, are 700 times higher than the direct carbon footprint. For Swedbank Lithuania, it's no different. Swedbank Lithuania has lending which equals 12% of Lithuania's GDP. Its balance sheet is 30% of Lithuania's GDP. So it's, it's no, uh, uh, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to tell that basically we are a key transmission mechanism for emissions in the Lithuanian economy. So while we are at zero, already net zero for our direct emissions, we have set ourselves also a target to reach net zero by 2050 for all of our activities, including financing activities. But how do we get there? How do we join those two dots? I'm uh, being a CFO, I find it a bit hard to be honest, to accept a target which is 28 years ahead and where I don't have much control over how to achieve the target. Uh, in finance and in economics, uh, forecasting tends to be losing a lot of its reliability beyond a one-year horizon. Uh, and that's when you have good data. And in the case of climate and carbon, we don't have good data today. We have a lot of estimates and we don't have much detail. Um, so the way I see it, uh, there are two things that need to be done. First of all, we need to understand the situation as much as we are currently able to today. And second of all, we need to break down that long-term target into manageable steps. As a first step, what we've been doing is we've been busy estimating the um, uh, footprint of our real estate related portfolios, which constitutes the majority, the biggest part of our financing portfolios. In, in, in essence, to put it simply, what we do is we estimate, first of all, the energy efficiency and second of all, the mix of energy used by our real estate clients. Uh, we are then using a methodology developed by the Science-Based Targets Institute, which is a, an international body specialized in carbon accounting and climate scenarios, in order to derive 
from those estimates intermediate targets which are consistent with global warming of less than 1.5 degrees. Once uh, those uh, targets are validated by the experts at the Science-Based Targets Institute, we will publish them and then we will report annually on how we're doing to reach those targets. In addition, as we go along, we will improve the measurements that we do uh, as better data becomes available and, of course, expand the targets to uh, cover other portfolios in order to capture as much as possible of our indirect emissions. So that will enable me to start drawing a line towards the 2050, right? But so what? Um, are we going to start turning away clients in order to achieve those indirect emissions targets? Clearly not, because that would be neither good for business nor for the planet. Our path is made up of your paths. It's no good if we simply turn away high emission lending and we're not here to act as a climate police. We're here basically to work out together how to finance the transformation. And in order to accelerate on that journey, which is likely to be quite a long journey, we have launched, first of all, and continue to develop products which are inherently green. For example, green leasing, green home loans, solar loans, uh, lending to renewable energy, lending for energy efficiency. Secondly, we are rolling out sustainability-linked loans, which are loans which are designed specifically to support the transformation by rewarding the borrower um, for uh, meeting performance indicators related to sustainability, such as uh, emissions, rewarding the borrower with better borrowing conditions. Um, and finally, we are uh, uh, developing a tool to help businesses in different sectors assess their own performance on sustainability. So, to conclude, um, we are at the beginning of a long journey. We are learning how to reevaluate our own portfolios. Swedbank's pledge is to bring these ultimately to net zero by 2050. And this will be a journey that we need to take together. Thank you.